Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp. I'm the Chief Digital Manager for Dataversity. Thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Lessons in Data Modeling with Donna Burbank. Today, Donna will discuss the evolving role of the data architect. What does it mean for your career? Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. And we very much encourage you to chat with us and with each other throughout the webinar. To do so, just click the chat icon in the upper right-hand corner to activate that feature. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights of questions via Twitter using hashtag LessonsDM. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the recording of the session and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker, Donna Burbank. She's a recognized industry expert in information management with over 20 years of experience helping organizations enrich their business opportunities through data and information. She is currently the managing director of Global Data Strategy. Strategy Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. She has worked with dozens of Fortune 500 companies worldwide in the Americas, Europe, Asia, and Africa, and speaks regularly at industry conferences. In fact, she just spoke at Enterprise Data World um, at our conference in Atlanta last month and is doing so much with us. We thank her, as always. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Donna to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Hello, thank you. Always a pleasure to do these and always a pleasure to see so many people joining us. Um, as you mentioned, I was able to see a few folks at Enterprise Data this world where I did a world this year and put a few names with faces because <laughs> we often get some of the same folks and that's great. Um, so yeah, we will just jump in. Um, uh, Shannon already introduced me and I, I think you guys all, most of you know me and we will actually talk a little bit more about me at the end so I won't talk much here. I will say that I am on Twitter at Donna Burbank um, and as Shannon mentioned um, there is a hashtag today um, at LessonsDM if you kind of want to have an online chat or questions as we go along. A um, little bit about the series, um, if you're not aware, this is an every month kind of thing. So a um, couple things I wanted to point out here. Um, a, the ones in the past are on demand, um, so you can basically hear the whole thing you missed um, without Q&A, obviously. Um, and the ones coming up, you can see, you may want to join. Um, and you'll see that the one we highlighted here today is, is a little different than most. And this one's, I want to leave time for questions, A, because we seem to be getting more and more questions each each month as people kind of join and, and get used to the concept. Um, and I've actually had pre-questions this time uh, that folks um, have kind of emailed me ahead of time and said, could you cover this or I wanted to ask you about this. Um, and the other thing I wanted to point out about this series, it won't be as meaty, this one, in terms of content, but I will be referring and actually blatantly stealing some slides from some of the other sessions because I think the whole point of this series is that the role of the data architect is evolving and there is tons of hot, cool stuff uh, that you can be doing that relate to data model in the organization. And this series almost summarizes that from enterprise architecture to BI to MDM and data integration. Um, so data architecture in and of itself is interesting and cool, um, but there's also, I find it more interesting when you apply it to other either business problems or technical challenges, and if you do want to kind of um, broaden out across the enterprise, this is a great way to do it. So um, hopefully you can, if anything uh, piques your interest today, some of it you can go back to previous either this year or even last year we had um, a bunch of webinars, um, or you can join some of the ones coming up. So it's not going to be as uh, detailed and techy as maybe some of the ones in the past. Um, it's hopefully going to be more kind of about you guys. So um, please do um, jump in with Q&A if we don't cover it. And during the session, we'll cover it at the end. Um, so uh, this slide I've actually used before, but I think it's important. Um, data is hot, right? Data is now, we've been talking with for old folks like me, we've been talking about data-driven business for years. Uh, I've been in the business over 20 years, and I think us smart people have always known that data is important, um, but I think the rest of the universe is catching up to us finally, um, and partly because of the technology. It is just growing so fast, and there are so many opportunities. So I think unless you lived under a rock, uh, you have heard the Harvard Business Review <laughs> uh, statement about the data scientist being the sexiest job of the 21st sec century. You know, I always caveat that with they have a much different definition of sexy than <laughs> I do. I think data is cool. I don't know if it's sexy. Um, but it's not just them. Uh, Forbes, Wall Street Journal, these are just a few. I just Googled quickly, and you'll see 
everybody wants to be a data-driven business. So that is a great opportunity for us. And I don't want um, people to get hung up. Um, I, I think hope people reviewing this webinar later don't get offended by my crossing out the word data scientist. Nothing wrong with data scientists. They're awesome people, awesome role. Uh, if you want to aspire to be one or, or if you are one on the call, that's great. Um, but I think we um, – maybe overthink that. I think most people in the business or people who are finding out that data is cool just think data is cool. <laughs> so I, I don't think whether you're a data architect, data engineer, database administrator, um, et cetera, et cetera, data science, I don't think that necessarily matters. I think there's opportunity for all of us. Um, so for anyone re listening to this later, um, Nothing wrong with data scientists, and I'm crossing them out. Um, but I think that is is important to know that this is our time in the sun, and, and I think we should take it. And there's a lot of opportunity, which is one of the reasons we hosted this webcast. We get, I get personally so many questions. What, what are the opportunities? What can I do? How do I grow? And I think the world's your oyster. Finally, <laughs> um, it has been for a while, but it's been especially now. Um, and I want to talk a little bit more about that because I think finally. Um, that uh, the data-driven business has come to this front, and I think this is a great opportunity for data pro professionals to sort of have a seat at the table, as they say. And I'll talk more about this, um, that there's this idea of becoming a data-driven company, kind of making the business more efficient. Um, and then more and more companies are really seeing this as transformative and really becoming a data company. I've worked with several companies that that is on the wall. You know, I wish I had come up with it, but before I even came in, you know, we are now a data company. And I think folks like, um, you know, Facebook and Uber and Amazon, you know, they sort of transformed the marketplace through data. And I think a lot of companies are saying, ooh, I want some of that too. You know, success breeds success. And I think we are well-placed uh, to help with that. Um, and so I think if you want to see the table and really want to start, you know, kind of really making a change in your business, now's the time, I think, because a lot of the people who want to really be data-driven, I, I often am brought in with clients, and these are kind of my more fun projects. Not that any project is not fun, but I, I love these when people say, you know, I want to be a data-driven business because you help me understand what that means. Um, and because my, I'm a, I'll talk about this later, I'm an economics major initially, and I think the whole business side of it is really fun. Um, and so kind of mixing the two is kind of my my personal day in the sun. Um, so I, I kind of think that's neat. Uh, so a little bit more about that. When we think about how can we transform our business through data, as I mentioned, I, I see this two separate things. There's probably a lot of different flavors of that. Um, but one is, you know, how do we do better business optimization? To me, that's becoming a data-driven company, which is taking what we do and doing it more efficiently. So I'm going to have better marketing campaigns to sell what we're selling, or I'm going to make better products because now, you know, think of, I did some work for a, a telecom company, um, and you can actually, well, creep, creep factor or good data, depending on how you're looking at it, you know, you can actually see the click-through of, of who's using what and what products people are using and how people are using it. So if you're a product manager, what great – what better feedback than that? So if we want to really optimize our product, we have the data to do that. Internet of Things, you can you know do a lot of this type of thing. Um, better customer support. So some of my companies or, or my customers are using you know big data and what, can I can I mine support logs and see sentiment analysis of my customers? Um, can I use big data to kind of predict network out outages and make sure that I have more efficient service? You know, so so many things we can do with data because we just couldn't didn't have the technology to do that. You know, some of this we could do before, but you can do it a whole lot better you know, with some of these new technologies. And you can do it at a lot lower cost. Or, um, you know, I think a lot of companies are getting more and more now, too, is that you can make generate a lot of efficiencies through data. Can I optimize the supply chain of my data by getting the data of my company by getting the data flow better? Um, you know, I often start with a project, and we'll talk a little bit about this later. I often start with a process, business process model, because data and process are unrelated. So before we ask what, how do you become a data-driven business, show me what your data business is. And let's walk through that business process. Where is data touched? And then how can you use that data to really optimize those processes? Or is there a piece we didn't see where if we could get data earlier, we could make better decisions? All of that. So I would say that's more of the category of how do we do what we do better. But I think the even cooler new stuff um, that I think people are doing is how do we become a data company? How do we transform and actually do something completely different? Um, so, you know, the tell 
co-company that I worked with earlier, they were one that did have that, we want to be a data company in our, our wall, <laughs> their wall. Um, so yes, they can become more efficient by looking at network outages and linking customer support with, with you know, usage and that kind of thing. But they were actually monetizing some of their data. They were selling, when you think of it, anyone who travels anywhere to get to work generally has their cell phone. Um, so anonymized, of course, they did take privacy seriously, and I think more and more companies are getting that. Uh, but they were able to kind of monetize, anonymize and monetize fault traffic and sell that back to some city planners and say, if we're going to build a new rail system, where do people need to go? Where are they going now? So you know, do, is there data you are sitting upon in your company? Uh, there's one I'll talk about a little later, an energy company um, that is really using uh, data for smart metering, and it's the data um, that's really the valuable piece of the company, and I, I think you know that was a hot topic at EDW. How do we monetize data? How do we become you know more? Uh, the monetization of, of data is a hot topic, and I think a lot of companies are getting that. You know, Uber really it's the data. Um, they actually had a great presentation here in the Denver area a couple weeks ago, and they really explained how they did that. Um, it's fascinating, um, and it really was all data driven and and stuff we just didn't have before with some of this new real time big data platforms um, and I think that is an opportunity for us in the data field is that a lot of the companies that come to me say I know I want to be data driven where I have the gap is I don't quite get what that means you know what does that mean moving my on prem to the cloud or to Hadoop and I think that's where us in the data architecture realm we do get that so if we can be seen as the trusted advisors to help with that that is an amazing opportunity um, and we do play in the unique role, so you might, as, as with many of my slides, if you've joined, you might be wondering, what the heck is she getting at here? Um, so if you're familiar with the, the god Janus, way back in your history class, um, comes from the, the, the month January, comes from this god, uh, because the idea of January at the beginning of the year, he has one face looking at the new year and one face looking back at the old year. So um, it's kind of this two-headed, not, not a monster, actually, he looks like a good guy, so it's two-headed god, actually, we are the gods of data, um, where I see data architects as a bit of the Janus of the data world in a few ways. One is I think most data architects I've worked with are kind of that unique role that they can flip their head, <laughs> that doesn't gross, gross you out, it's not a 360 kind of horror movie here, but you can flip your head in one direction and talk tech. You know, I want to know how do I optimize by platform, should it be... Um, you know, an, an on-premise solution, um, or should it be in the cloud? Should I use Hadoop, or should I use a relational database? You know, so we can kind of switch to that. Should I have an appliance? You know, all these type of things. Um, and then you can switch and talk to the business person. You know, I'm talking business rules. I'm talking regulations. I'm looking at business opportunities. I might be creating a business glossary. So on the same day, you might be talking about the database administrator, about, you know, taking your logical model and optimizing it for performance and tuning. Um, and you may be speaking to the business of what do we mean um, by, you know, what is a default credit swap and how, how does that how do I publish that in the, in the glossary? So I think that's why data architecture is fun, <laughs> because I think you can have that unique role. And I think that's why we have a very unique place in the business, that I think if we can leverage that part of our skill set and personality, that's what people are looking for right now. You know, you know think of anything. I want to buy a new car. Wouldn't I love to go to a, you know, with a friend who's a car mechanic or a car engineer that can explain all the things, or I want to buy... Um, a new pair of skis. I would love to go to it with a ski expert that knew all the different models and, and makes. You know, sometimes it's a salesperson, but I think anything that's technical, um, you'd love to have that friend that kind of knew what you wanted and could explain it to you in an easy way. Um, you know, what's that? If anyone listens to National Public Radio, the car talk guys, you know, they're kind of classic at that. You know, people call and they want someone they can just kind of trust and explain it to in a clever, funny way that you get. And I think people want, um, maybe we're the car talk guys of data. Um, Anyway, I think people are looking for that, um, and we have that role. I think also, it may be more literally of the one head looking forward and one head looking backwards, I think we do play a really unique role in that we do understand the core architectural principles. I mean, there there are so many new technologies. Now, it does make my head spin, um, and I think that's why it's an exciting time to be in data management. I mean, I... I'm a big old nerd. I don't mind saying it, and I am still learning new things every day. There seems to be a new technology coming out or a new way to store data or make it faster or more real-time or to split it and parse it and <laughs> do time series analysis in different ways. You know, But I think I can understand that more quickly than the average person on the street because I do have a computer science um, degree and, and understand some of the core principles, and all of us in the business have had some of that history that we can build from. Um, so we can kind of help companies or your 
own organization understand where this new technology fit. Um, so I think that's fun, and I think that's um, a great opportunity. I think, you know, it's always – it's hard in this industry, and I'll talk a little bit more about this. You can say, oh, I have 20 years of experience, and, you know, that can be the nail in the coffin, right, because you've got these new young whippersnappers, you know, in Silicon Valley, and these these technologies didn't didn't exist 20 years ago. So you don't want to be seen as outdated yet. Again, no one starts something from scratch. These are all built upon previous technologies. So you know, here in the Boulder area, for where I live, Boulder, Colorado, for some reason it's sort of a hotbed of data folks, um, and they have data meetups where I kid you not, you know, 200 people will show up and, and talk data science and big data and analytics and a lot of the new hot technologies that are coming out. And you know, I, have to, I have to admit, I was almost shy to go to a few of these because, you know, I felt old. <laughs> it was not going to be 20-year-olds. And there were some 20-year-olds, but there were a lot of gray hairs, and there were a lot of 40-year-olds and a lot of folks in between. And when I sort of explained what I did and how long I'd been in the business and doing things like governance and, you know, some of those things, I expected a bit of poo-pooing the, the kids. I'll call them the kids, the 20-year-olds. Sorry for any of you who are 20 on the – because I hated when people called me a kid when I was 20, but you are. Um, <laughs> Because that's old people know how long life is. And then the real, old people older than me are probably laughing at me, thinking, yeah, you think you're old. Um, but they, they were very fascinated to hear, oh, wow, um, I, I would love to know how companies are actually applying this. You've actually worked with a Wall Street bank that's doing some of this you know, real-time data analysis. Could you explain how that works? Or how do you govern this data? So I found that it's really a fun way to kind of share. Um, and they were doing some of the new hot tech advances that I hadn't heard of yet. So, again, if, if we have an open mind, um, and we can share our experiences both with the business and with other technologists in the organization. Um, again, we have a lot of opportunity. Um, so some of you have seen this slide before. Um, repetition helps ingrain it in your mind. But somebody, um, I haven't checked if they're on the call, uh, be careful saying you like something. You'll see it again. Um, but someone said they kind of like my little third number form guy. You might wonder what this is. Um, but the more I work in IT, I consider myself a techie person. I realize so much of it is the people side. Um, and there are different personalities, and the more we think about that and, and realize that and work with that appropriately, as well as our own personality, I think that will help us. So you might wonder about this little guy in the corner. Um, I'll, I'll explain that. So I think the good thing about data architects is that we do – um, are able to speak both technology and we are able to um, talk business. We are often not shy. Um, I was with, you know, one sponsor that asked me to come in and talk to a bunch of architects, and I said, oh, there probably won't be a bunch of questions. And I said, oh, you don't know data architects. There won't be questions, right? We, we, I think that is. That's the beauty of our many architects' personalities of we do like to talk. We get passionate about our models, um, but we can also maybe be a little too passionate. So that, that little guy, he sort of that strange guy on the street corner wearing the sign saying, the world is not going to end. The world's going to end if your data model is not in third, north, third normal form, right? And I think we sometimes scare people. I, I've scared my friends. I, I What did you do at work today? And, you know, 20 minutes later, I come up for air, and I thought that was interesting. And they sort of say, yeah, big nerd, whatever. Um, so I think we have to remember um, that uh, not everybody loves our data model. I actually, uh, you might have heard me on these webinars before saying nobody cares about your data model, and I, I don't mean that because people do, but nobody does really. <laughs> and sometimes I, I actually said that to myself in my head, remember Donna, nobody cares about your data model. Keep it simple, apply it to their business. Because the other thing we tend to do um, is we often find, we're sort of paid to find problems, right? Uh, which is good. That's what an engineer sort of does. You find a problem and you fix it. But we can also often become seen as negative, um, and we can seem be sometimes seen as the old fogies, right? Oh, those architecture people are always telling us what we can't do. Those governance people always say no. You don't want to be the person always saying no. There might be a reason to say no. There might be problems, but can you come with a solution, right? So when you think of the business executive in the middle, um, like any human being, it's the what's in it for me. Um, but almost by definition, when you think of an entrepreneur or a business person, they're, they are very optimistic. They're sort of trained to be optimistic. They're looking for opportunities. Oh, I know we're going to be a data-driven business, and we're going to be just like Uber, and we can do. What they don't want is the architect to go, no, nope, can't do that. We have a relational database. It's hard. We have 6 million data attributes, and just to rationalize them is going to take you – know, you're, you're, you're out of the room. You're out of the discussion. So not to say that isn't hard. Um, but can you put on your opportunity hat, um, I guess is my advice there, right? So um, can you say yes 
and. <laughs> yes, it's hard, and we could maybe start with a um, a sandbox. And you know, later we may have to integrate some of the on-premise customer data, but we could start here. And uh, as I said, we should look at personalities, but we should look at our own. Are we being an old curmudgeon, right? I, I have to do that with myself. I remember when I first came into tech, I was so excited. There was so much cool stuff. Anything new, I was absorbing. And then I think we get a little complacent. Um, and, and, and I have to remember, are you, do you still have that excitement you did when you were in university studying this stuff? Um, because it, it is even more exciting now. Um, so you don't want to say, oh, yeah, I've been here for 20 years. Nothing changes. It's all the same. It is not all the same. <laughs> you know, there's some same fundamentals. Uh, but do I think if I could give one piece of advice, it would be that um, – is try to put on the opportunity hat. You know, don't be all Pollyanna and everything's perfect if it isn't, um, but just think of the person who's definitely what's in it for me. Um, and to that third column, can you be seen more as that data advisor, right? So data architect, of course, but the advisor, can you say, and I think companies are, well, I know, because they, they call my company in to do this a lot, um, uh, but be more of that data advisor so that you might say, you know, I know you want to be data driven. Have you seen these new graph databases? I know you're looking to do some customer, you know, relationship analytics. This would be an awesome thing. Um, you know, don't want to bore you with the details, but I think this is something you might want to look at. I think business people are open to that. Um, so the analogy I use, I know it's sort of an overused analogy, the one of the architect of the house. Um, but I think, you know, especially with something like the the, the rise of uh, big data, self service. I want to say big data. Self-service BI, a lot of people are starting to do it themselves and kind of look at the data and get more interested. I, I kind of have the analogy of a house, right? So I might, you know, start to build a, a shed in my yard or I'm going to paint my my office or I want to add some siding to my house. You know, I can do some of those things. Yeah, I think most people can kind of do a certain level. But if I'm going to build an apartment building or a major addition on my house, um, I'm going to hire an architect. And, and I think I'm going to hire an architect that I trust. And I think that's where we want to be is that, you know, don't, don't poo-poo folks saying, oh, you can never do your own self-service BI, but you want to help them with that. So I did do a big renovation to my house and, and did interview a lot of different architects or contractors types of things and, and rolled a few out because a few acted like somebody did architects that are the negative ones that, oh, it's too hard, you can't do that, or, you know, you shouldn't do anything yourself. You need to hire me to paint all the walls. And, you know, I can paint walls. <laughs> um, the one I did hire was, oh, that would be cool. I see where you're going with that. We could build this. Um, and, and I trusted his advice of can't take down that wall. It's load-bearing. Good, thank you. That's why I hired an architect, right? So I think that's what the business wants. Oh, don't use a graph database for your accounting system. That might not work, or maybe you should. Or these are the pros and cons. I think people are looking for someone to get data because I think people see the opportunity. So uh, I spent a lot of time in this slide, but there's a couple things to it. One is, you know, personality-wise, try to look at the positive. Um, try to look at what's in it for them. So can you focus your conversation on? their marketing campaign, their need to be data-driven. They're busy, and you can make this faster for them. I mean, I've seen some um, architects say, oh, I, I don't like self-service BI because I feel like it's putting me out of a job. Um, one of the architects I, I hired said, I don't want you doing any do it yourself because you should hire me to do that. Well, I didn't hire that person. I can do certain things myself. Um, but I think the, I've also seen architects be heroes in data architecture, and we'll talk about the for business um, Self-service BI, because people just like me with a house. I know what I don't know. <laughs> you get to a certain point, and you call somebody in who's the expert, and I think that's where architects can be. So I don't want to beat the point home, but I do think it's an important one with this. Can you move from data architect, where you're kind of the nerdy kid that they bring in because they have to, um, or are you the data advisor where they bring in, that person's got cool ideas. Um, I know they could help us. I know we want to do this certain thing. They can explain how. Um, or maybe they'll have a new idea I haven't thought of. Um, and I think that's where a lot of the opportunity in your career can, can come. And we do it too. It's not like people hate data or anything, and you might have seen this, I think it was last month I showed this, but I think I think it hits the point home, right? We all go, why don't people care about my data? Do you really care about anybody else's job? So when your accountant comes to you and is like, well, you know, we recently switched from an accrual-based accounting to a cash pay. I just want my paycheck, right? And think of almost anything else. Think of the engineer running the heating of your office. You just want the heat to work. You know, you just want your car to start. Um, you might be kind of interested in your car if you're a car person, but really you kind of just want it to start. Um, so 
think about that. We don't get too much into the details, but when you do, apply it to their job and how you can help them, right? We're all people. We all have our own things to care about. Um, again, some of these are reused slides, but I think they all fit together. And, and can we tell a story? Again, that, that Janus of the fact that we can often communicate and, and explain the business, the fact that data models, if you're a data modeler, kind of naturally are graphical, um, that we should have evolved. You know, my, I heard this on the radio a few weeks ago that someone had said that we can't even dream without dreaming in stories, right? We, we can't even sleep without dreaming in stories. We always have pictures in our head. We're always thinking. We're always going. Um, so if you can relate the data to a real-world impact or scenario, the reason we need governance is because, you know, it's kind of what we can get a better view of our customer if we're all talking together and know where the data is. We can get better lineage or you're not going to get in trouble with this regulation or something. But I think you need to relate it to a story. And I think uh, we as architects are kind of well positioned to do that. A, we often have the big picture in our heads and often we're sort of well suited to explain that. Um, I've used these before and kind of showed them before. And I think, remember, be creative in your discussion. You might just show a high-level business model. Can we take that architecture we know, take the business rules that we often know, and tell that story to the business? You know, I'm is a customer the same as a client? In the picture, it looks like the same person. Are they different? Oh, well, client is what support uses. You know, customer is what sales uses. Are they the same thing? Yeah, we could probably rationalize that. Or no, they're not because you're not a client if you're not on a support maintenance clause or something. You know, that's where you start to get those rules out of people's heads. Um, and again, start being that trusted advisor. You can explain why that matters. You can really explain how they can see opportunities of, oh, did you know that if we could link your prospect database with your product sales, we could kind of see patterns. You know, let me get because you you are in there seeing this data that you know the business people might not know. Um, and again. You know, some folks, you might think you could go tell them we can't get this because, and sometimes that's valid, but do we always turn it around and say, did you know if you could get this in reporting by linking A with B? We're all humans. We all want to see the opportunity. We want to see the benefit. So kind of flipping it around that way sometimes can be very helpful. Um, and, and if you've ever been in one of my classes, and I have talked about this a lot, and, you know, I, I've done a lot in my career, and we'll talk about that in a bit, um, and training salespeople and, and selling stuff. <laughs> um, and that was valuable background because we're always selling. We can we can poo-poo marketing. We can poo-poo selling. But we're always being sold to. And, you know, think of it. Is everyone here on the call wearing generic clothes? Probably not. You probably have a brand you like. Your car is probably a branded. And, yes, we're affected by marketing and sales pitches. Um, so think of your sales pitch for your data project. Um, and I, I've told this story before too, but you know, I actually had this moment early in my career where the CEO was riding up the elevator with me and asked, what are you working on? Uh, and I explained to him and he said, well, how, you know, what's, what's the bigger picture? What does that product do? And I, I, I didn't have a good answer and I felt stupid and that's always the best way to learn something is to feel stupid once and you never will again. Um, but a couple tips on that. So you could, you know, explain to the CEO, well, I'm working on a project to rationalize metadata across sources to ensure consistency. You know, you've lost them. That might be what you're doing. Um, or could you flip it around and say, I'm working on a project to get a better view of customers for that big campaign you're working on for the big marketing launch? Then they're interested, right? And you may explain um, what you're doing later, but they probably don't care <laughs> or at a very high level, and you need good data to do that. So across the board, um, all of us do this. Um, so when I do do this in the class, everybody who is an architect or a technology always does the former, even though we've just spent the whole module saying, related back to the person, um, we always start with, well, I'm building a data warehouse to help with your marketing campaign. And then we step back and we realize what we did, and like, did we didn't start with the first one. We, did, we, didn't, we said, it should be your marketing campaign. <laughs> and I do this all the time. I used to do demos, um, you know, when I was a solutions consultant, and, and I'd spend all night working on a problem problem and fixing it. And I'd go to, to show it to the customer, and the first thing i do is talk about the problem I just fixed it, which is the worst thing to start with, you know, start with a pro problem. But that's what was on my head, and it was so hard to step back and just take a breath and think, what do they want to see? What's their point of view? Um, and I think that's valuable, especially when you're trying to sell your product. What do they care about? How do you set it up quickly in two minutes and make, make sure they care? Um, and frustrating or not, um, I have seen clients, work, been lucky enough to work with a lot of different customers and different industries, countries, languages around the world, um, and I've seen some awesome technology, and I've often seen some awesome technology get no attention because no one sold it appropriately. Um, and I remember in university when I'd learned, we'd learn about these different database options. I'm like, how come we use, don't use that one? That one seemed cool. 
and they didn't have the better marketing team. Right? So this meant some great technology that went by the wayside. So make sure that's not your project um, and sell it, sell it, sell it. It might feel uncomfortable, um, but I think you have to let people know know what you're doing. Um, and again, that might be outside. We as data architects tend to be good communicators, um, but all, a lot of us, myself included, might be an introvert and, and kind of would rather just be coding on your computer. <laughs> so that might be outside our comfort zone. Um, so go a little outside your comfort zone and, and maybe try that little sales pitch or take a sales class or I'll you know, get to that towards the end of kind of expanding your horizons can really be helpful. Um, and that's what I love about my job um, is that I do go to a lot of odd and various and sundry different industries and it's amazing what you learn and in one industry applies to something that's completely irrelevant. You know, what might I worked with a water company and what, what water um, piping actually helped me with a restaurant company because the, the supply chain was similar. I right? wouldn't have thought that initially. Um, so I think a lot of the weird jobs we have in our life can actually help um, in strange ways. So broaden your horizons there. Um, but more about data and less about people. Um, the, the other great thing about architecture it is when we think of these new hot technologies and trends, um, do they apply to us? Yes. I think everything from, I think I've already explained this idea of the data-driven business and data strategy and data optimization and business optimization. Yes, that applies to you because you get the data and a lot of people don't. And I think, and I still do that. I think we forget that a lot of people don't because anything you know seems easy. Um, and being able to explain that to somebody who probably is a data newbie because data is new to a lot of people, um, that's an amazing skill. Um, and so don't belittle that just because you know how these databases work. Um, I think a lot of people want to know what's in your head. Um, and then some of the more traditional things we've heard about that are coming to the forefront over and over, um, data governance, master data management, data analytics, BI, et cetera, et cetera. I'll go into some of the newer ones at the end. Yes, they all apply um, to data architecture. Um, so we'll go through a few examples again, as I said, if you missed the beginning. Um, there are webinars on each one of these practically uh, throughout the year or in the past. So if you want to do a deep dive on uh, BI, for example, we did that a couple months ago, I think. So you can always do a replay of that. So we're just going to touch the highlights. Um, so I've showed this before as well. This is kind of our framework for um, my company of how we generally approach things. And you'll see at the top, it kind of really starts with that business strategy, business alignment. And goes right down to the bottom to all the hard stuff too, right? That, not that business strategy isn't hard. That is very hard in itself. But from the databases, relational to big data to unstructured, semi-structured, you know, all of that. And you'll see the data architecture and related disciplines like data asset planning and data integration and metadata. They're right there at the center. Because um, if you want to do the other things in the diagram that we'll talk about, like MDM or warehousing or governance, you need a good architecture. So, you know, it was kind of hard to put this together because everything's intertwined. It's all inter interlocking keys, but you really can't do any of it without a solid architecture. So, you know, architecture will continue to be relevant uh, no matter what technology we're looking at. Um, and when we do talk about enterprise data strategy, it it always can. In fact, last year, if you wanted to replay, we did the webinar just on that, just on data strategy and how that applies to data modeling and where that fits. And this is slide stolen from there. So when you think of the business strategy, um, we start with a conceptual data model. You know, what are the pieces of information we want for the strategy? Is it product, customer, on, online social trends, external data? Um, we start at the top. And yes, business people will consume that. They'll understand it if you keep it at a high level and tell the story. Big fan of that. Um, I've actually, I, again, back to the, I would work all night with a problem um, and, and start with a problem when I was dem demoing something. I think, maybe it's just me, but I think sometimes, you know, techie people, we can be self-deprecating and think no one wants to hear about our model. So I, sort of say, I know you guys don't want to see this. I had one customer say, why do you keep saying that? I love these things. I love these models. They make so much sense to me. Um, so I think we should stop saying that because architecture is cool. I think maybe our time in the sun, we're not used to it. We're kind of blinking in that sunlight going, wait, <laughs> we're suddenly cool. You do want to see my data model? Um, because that is happening. And I'm, I'm suddenly surprised. I'm, I'm I know I've told this story before, but I will tell it over and over because it's awesome. Um, so I, I did, a, did a governance project, of, I guess it was last summer, um, for a big restaurant chain. And I walk in, and it was the marketing team was the sponsor. And we walk in the room. I kid you not, this is I can't exaggerate, but this is not an exaggeration. The marketing team goes, 
I am so excited to see you data governance people. I love data governance. You're going to help us. I mean, we wouldn't have heard that before. But marketing put together is that they wanted to do these campaigns. They needed data. They started looking at the data, and they got that the data was a mess, and they needed an architecture, and they needed governance, and they needed all the hard stuff, and they wanted somebody to do it for them, <laughs> and we were those people. Um, and so, yes, you will have those words. They are, they, they are up there. I think I still get surprised. Um, so, yes, at the conceptual model, that's the modeling the business. At the the bottom level, the physical model, um, that's important too. So, you know, do I understand the database structures? Can we optimize the database structure? Should it be relational? Should it be graphs? Should it be um, a, a document database? And, and I think and we'll talk about this at the end as well. If some of those terms aren't familiar with you, to you, they should be because not everything is a relational database. And I think a lot of folks um, grew up with a relational database who are in architecture and you know, there's always been more than that, but I think they all need models and they can all be uh, modeled. And then all the things around the data modeling ecosystem, so things like lineage and impact analysis and metadata management and standards and glossaries and all of that tend to fall in the realm of architecture and are very much needed. So um, I talked about this a little bit. I thought it was worth um, while we're kind of on that topic of business transformation and um, how data can support that. This was a company we worked with in the UK and England. Um, almost a perfect example of the case I gave where they had on their wall with the poster, uh, we are a data company. And one of the reasons is when you think about it, it's a little ironic that you know, this is a company, when you think of it was consumer energy like electricity and gas and that kind of thing, um, and they're trying to incent their customers to use less of it, right? So you have a product and, and you're trying to get your customers to use less, which is sort of the opposite of most people that are trying to sell more. So that's sort of a not necessarily the best business model. So when they looked at it, what was an asset they could leverage? It was the data itself. So can you do things like smart meters, Internet of Things, have people control their own heat? You're at home, you want to turn down the heat on your cell phone and that kind of thing. Um, and they were basically transforming the business to be a data company, new things like big data, Internet of Things. But very really quickly they realized they need an architecture to do this, and they really need – there's a lot of – legacy data out there, and do they even know who their customers are to get the, how, how, can you turn down the heat um, of your cell phone, but do I have the right address, right? So, um, so one of the things we kind of started was what is that business critical data element? What does need to be architected? And a lot of it was we need to get our kind of small data right. We do need to have an architecture and governance um, to do that. Um, and then which, which does make more sense on a big data platform and what needs to stay on-prem. Uh, they started a new data governance program that they never had. They put data quality play in place. So again, sort of ironically, um, so you know, when you think of it, this was all about business transformation. It was all about kind of the new stuff, or not even new anymore, right? The big data and the Internet of Things. And the first thing they started was was kind of the more traditional stuff because you're going to walk before you can run. And that wasn't negative. They were still doing the cool new stuff. They were just doing it in the more um, practical and, and transformed way. So it, it does. It's not an either or, um, and, and I don't. I think more and more companies are realizing that. I mean, I've been in this business forever, and things like architecture and governance um, are, are getting more popular, not less. So I think as people realize they want to do the cool stuff, that you need you need to do that um, wisely. So um, moving on, if I could actually move my slides one of those days. Uh, master data management. I think we're going to whiz through some of these, but this is almost classically um, an architecture problem um, that. When you think about it, I'm trying to get that single source of truth, well, A, what sources are out there? Do I have the source of all the different, say, we want a single view product or a single view of customer? You need to get the architecture to do that. I think getting that common structure um, with an MDM, if you do the hub system, for example, and that ability to talk to people. So where I've seen MDM hubs fail is, is that we get all the, uh, do we have all the right attributes? Do we know how we're using them? Do we have a process model to integrate them? Um, and, and I think that's where architecture can come into play. So again, this is an area where I've gone into companies and they haven't had an architecture, but they wanted the MDM and realized they need an architecture to do MDM. <laughs> so it's almost impossible uh, to do this well if you don't have some sort of um, architecture behind it. The other area that this often falls into, um, and I always, um, even if it's a, you know, all this stuff, yes, you can boil the ocean, you can have all of this take forever. I always say start with an afternoon. Try doing it on a whiteboard in an hour, and if you can, you could probably do a lot more than you can expect just by starting there. If it needs to take more, 
you can. Obviously, it's probably more than an hour on a whiteboard. Um, but don't don't be scared away by doing it. Um, when I get this sometimes with customers, I'll say, I need to do a process model, and that seems really hard. And I said, okay, well, I'll do a workflow and just show really quickly how this fits. Because I think data architecture does tie into things like enterprise architecture, um, which we talked about, I think it was January. Um, and I almost can't think of data without thinking of process or what business capabilities are we trying to support. And when you're thinking of things like MDM, you'd better be thinking of this. Who, what business capabilities are using the data? What business processes um, are using the data? That restaurant chain I mentioned, it, it almost turned more into a process. They didn't have a lot of data. They had a lot of data that was being touched, a little bit of data that was being touched by a lot of different people and all different processes. So that could have been a recipe for failure pun intended, a uh, recipe, for, recipe for a restaurant. Um, for failure, by not taking looking at that, you might have said, oh, it's not that hard. They only have, you know, 500 recipes, and I could just do that really quickly. But the hard part was understanding the touch points, and, and I think that's where an architecture comes into place. So, no, you don't need to buy a huge fancy process tool. Some people do. The water company I mentioned did have a big fancy process tool because it was an engineering company, really, and you need to un you know understand process. So, again, sometimes you need deep process, sometimes you need a light process, but don't not look at it. Sometimes you need deep business capability models. If, um, if you don't know what those are, ch check out the, the January webinar. But you know, if you're thinking of transforming the business and you don't understand what your core capabilities are and, and how data applies to that, you'd better at least, at least start to think about these. Um, so architecture is architecture, and data is generally at the center of a lot of those different architectures. Um, so uh, business intelligence and self-service uh, BI, again, a lot of folks can say, um, you know, so, and I have, again, the, the good side of some of this huge rise in new tools is there are so many tools out there that can do so much so quickly. Um, so in the BI uh, session we talked about, you know, you can download open data, you can use these awesome new visualization tools and the awesome new munging tools and do a lot, but if there's no metadata behind it and you have fields like F1, F2, um, and you don't know where that data came from and there's no code sets around it and it takes a long time to run because you haven't really optimized the data structure, you're going to run into a, a bottleneck. And I think that's where architects can come in. Cause a, you can create things like these code sets and the reference sets and, and you can help describe how an architecture could be optimized and you can't just report on you know, a million data elements and expect that could be fast if you don't architect it in a certain way. And I think I've seen a lot of architects be heroes um, in this scenario because I think the business wants that. Yes, I, in fact, one of my favorite quotes that I don't have in here was from a business user and we were trying to explain the reason why we needed a glossary and architecture and metadata and they looked at us and they said, I mean, you're not doing that? Of course, yes, we want that. <laughs> go, go off and do. We should have thought you were. And I think until they saw the data, um, they didn't realize how bad it was, which is often often the case. So that little quote in the, in the lower right, you know, a lot of the self-service BI professionals, data scientists, especially, et cetera, they spend you know, a huge part of their day cleaning, reformatting, munging data to make it fit for purpose, and they don't want to. They just want to do the report. So if you can take some of that heavy lifting off their plate and look like heroes and, and, and do some of that, you know, obviously there's governance around it, um, and they need to play some part. Um, but I think that's a positive rather than a negative. And I have a lot of teams I work with where the, there is sort of a, a user element to that self-service BI, I mean a support element. Uh, they can actually work with the users to do that, and that's a good place to be. Um, governance came up. This is one of the pre-questions that came in before the webinar that I thought was worth talking to. Um, so governance is a big driver for architecture. I, I think there's, well, there's many parts of governance. A lot of it is the people process part. Is there a data governance steering committee? Um, you know, are there data stewards, both business and technical? I think, you know, having an architecture background, often it's the architecture that's your governance. You know, are, is there a domain? I, again, I often do a process model. I often look at capabilities whenever I come in to do a data governance. And sometimes some of these big problems were something like, well, there wasn't a drop down on the user interface. So people put in stupid state codes or stupid country codes because they just typed it in. Well, that's something where an architect can come in and say, could we just do a drop-down list and here's your standard reference set and we can use it and problem gone. Um, so I think you do, you're, again, you're that genus that you can, if you think of the role such as a technical data steward or um, that are kind of building the data structures or doing data quality checks, can, you know, and I've seen some groups where maybe that person who's the technical data steward is doing something like 
running a data cleansing tool, which is great. Um, but sometimes you can say, well, you know, if you normalize that data, you wouldn't have these data problems. Or if I had a domain or a drop down, or here's some data sets we can use. That's definitely in support of the data steward. You know, in the business data steward, you know, are, are there business definitions, are there glossary structures and taxonomies? And this is a, an art and a science, right? So it's not just putting a bunch of terms up there that are definitions. There's ways to create taxonomies. And, you know, again, that's where architecture comes in. So I've seen data architects on the data governance board, steering committees, whatever you call them. I've seen them as voting members. And again, titles don't matter so much. It's people a lot. It's do they trust you <laughs> to be the person who knows? And often I've heard, you know, you got to bring the architect in. They're the ones that know the business and the technology of the data. So I've seen them as voting members. Um, I've also seen them as kind of non-voting advisors. You know, think of back to that advisor slide. Um, and and be, be for that reason, uh, you know, it may be the you know marketing department that makes the final decision or the CFO that makes the decision, but they do want that trusted <laughs> data advisor in the room going, guys, does this make sense? And before I make a decision, is this going to have any negative effects? So, um, and I, I kind of hit on this earlier, but I think architecture and metadata really make that governance actionable. Now, if you're going to have a policy and procedure, if the more you can embed that in the structures um, and the audit and the lineage and all that to make it actionable, that's where it really kind of has the teeth, and so you have an opportunity there. Um, and, and I don't want to belittle this, there's only so much we can cover <laughs> sort of at a time. Um, emerging technologies need architecture too. So it doesn't, you know, we tend to think relational. So, you know, there, there can and should be structure in big data, not always. So can you be the one to say when do we need to structure a hive, um, something in a hive uh, table, or when do we not? When is it really just a, you know, kind of a sensor data stream? If I'm moving to the cloud, what, where is the PII information I need to track? You know, how do I, on one of our big clients in the UK, basically they're building data standards for Internet of Things data uh, and publishing that as open data sets. So yes, the structure behind the IoT. Um, I mentioned there was um, an amazing presentation from Uber, which I wish I could share, but we signed this big old NDA. <laughs> but it was, you know, and I thought they explained really well. They're using everything from taking sensor data from the cars and some of the pictures in the cars and where they're going and map data um, to trying to optimize each step of the way was a different architecture. For, and, and the question was, what are we trying to do with it? Are we trying to store it quickly? Are we trying to read it quickly? Are we trying to report on it quickly? And each of those requires a different structure. Um, and I think someone who understands that is super valuable. Yes, if you want to just store it quickly, you want to put it out in the S3 bucket, and that's what you need to do. But you might want to put tags, metadata tags on that, so you, need, you know, for example. Or, but if you want to report that on a data warehouse, you probably want to put that in a relational database, and here are some options, and star schema versus whatever. And it's getting back to that use case. And I think there's so few people that can understand those different architectures and why you use each one. Um, I want to do real-time chats on my website and get instantaneous statistics and usage patterns. Well, that's you know that's not a relational database, right? So, um, you know, I think someone that can speak that is a, a huge value to any organization. And to do that, you need to stay educated. And I think that's all of us. Yes, we're all busy. Put that out there. Um, I've done this. Um, I am a big fan of some of these online courses. Data diversity, of course. <laughs> I know you're all here. Um, but either things like Coursera, where you can do online courses, or many, you know, MIT has opened up a lot of its open courseware. And there is just an amazing wealth of stuff out there that's either free or really low cost. So there's almost no excuse to be really not really smart in this stuff. And I've seen, um, you know, when we think this is supposed to be more about your career, um, I've seen some – I'm a big fan of university, several degrees myself. Um, but one of the uh, younger gentlemen than one of my customers um, didn't have a – he only has a high school degree. And he learned a lot of stuff online. Um, and he's a whiz kid. Um, just didn't particularly have the means when he grew up. But he's smart enough, and he learned a lot online. So if you'd like to, um, there's a lot of opportunities. So a little bit in the chat, because I know um, folks are using that a bit. Any I missed? Anyone have a good uh, – place they go online that's not diversity or not, you know, Coursera or any of those? Anyone wants to chat it out? All right, well, um, there's a few I would say just look, and that's even changing over and over. Um, so, you know, keep things, keep keep your eyes open because stuff, uh, edX, someone mentioned, um, is another one that people might look at. I just to put that out there because I know we're, we tend to be the learning type and there's a lot of good stuff um, available. So take advantage of it, and if you're not, yeah, we're going to be a dinosaur pretty quickly. <laughs> Stuff changes so fast. Um, 
And the other thing is, data architects do come from uh, TDWI, was another one someone mentioned, e-learning. Um, so data architects come from a wide range of backgrounds, and I think that's what makes us special um, and effective. So for some reason, I've seen a lot of musicians. <laughs> you know, I have a friend that went to the Ber Berkeley School of Music in Jazz Theory, um, and he's a database administrator. Um, so I think there's something about music that's sort of logical yet creative that, you know, puts us in. So these are all um, titles that I have seen or actually worked with from chemistry to – there was one. It was actually at EDW a couple years ago, and the lady said, I was an accountant, and I was sick of seeing bad data, so I became a data architect. <laughs> you know, I sort of joined. I wanted to fix it. Um, so anything I've missed, if you want to put in the chat, I saw one say engineering, you know, more of just – traditional engineering, engineering, building stuff, right? Um, so I've seen anyone else have kind of a different uh, career that they've come from. You know, I've seen it, or some of these might not um, um, be initially thinking like a social worker, right? In fact, one of my customers, I said, oh, you know, we're the data people and all our customers are social workers. They won't get it. Well, a lot of statistics and, you know, population science um, in social work, they got it. <laughs> um, so I think there's a lot of things, physics is someone else that someone came back with. Um, so, again, you know, and if and if you aren't initially in data, um, I went back and got a computer, computer science degree partly because I just like the stuff. Um, but you don't have to. And there's a lot of stuff online and a lot of great, you know, way, it's just I think that often is our – Strength is that we operations research is something else that people came back with. So a lot of good stuff. Um, I'm going to quickly talk about me. Not to be, it seems like really self-centered, um, but I'll, I will give a call. One of the reasons I thought to do this is if anyone was at EDW this year in Atlanta, um, we had uh, Ursula Cotone. Cotone, yeah, was my Italian comes in. Um, so she did the keynote, and I think um, I think Shannon will send out the link later if I'm not wrong. Um, that you can get the videos of this later, and it's probably worth listening to. She kind of did a day in the life of how she ended up being chief data officer at a fairly large organization, and her crazy path to get there. It wasn't, you know, you don't go get a degree in chief data officership, if that's even anything, right? So I think most of us come back um, from a really odd way of doing things. So I'll quickly show you my crazy way to get where I got. So my initial degree was in economics and English. I don't mind saying it. Yeah, English major, way back. Um, but I think when you talk about communicating, that comes in really handy. <laughs> I've written a few books. Uh, you know, I think learning to speak. I was you know, on the debate team in college if we want to get nerd <laughs> nerd competition, right? Uh, and I think that really helped in terms of public speaking and that kind of thing. So, um, and in college, my parents always told me this. And in high school, I did a lot of weird jobs. From I was going to be, I was going to work on Wall Street. I was an economics person. I was going to be finance. So I did a lot of that. I also did some weird temp jobs. I actually did drive a fork truck. <laughs> actually, a truck. I mean, and I think especially now, what I do for a living, having worked in some of these industries um, and understanding how a business operates, is just super valuable. So I think all these strange things you do in life, if you're a smart person and can kind of apply that. It, nothing is wasted because it's amazing some of these things I have done. I worked in the fast food chain in high school, and I did a, did a job at a fast food company, and it sort of, you know, helped because I kind of done the, the done the walk, right? So I, I graduated, uh, went to D.C., worked in one of those economic think tanks, and we were doing – I guess you would have called me a data scientist back then. They didn't ask. I was sexy. <laughs> I had the data scientist. Um, so um, – we did kind of economic analysis. For me, it was awesome. Um, worked with a lot of the top secret security clearance, a lot of the decision makers around the globe flew around and worked with these decision makers and built models and built software to do that. Um, and I am not necessarily always good at predicting trends, and my stock patterns have maybe proven that. But in this case, I did. I said, hmm, this computer thing is going to take off, and data is really hot, and it's really interesting. You can make way a lot more money um, and we'll have more job opportunities than having to get a Ph.D. in economics. So I didn't. Uh, I went back and got a computer science degree uh, and became a programmer for a short period of time. Well, I was programming, actually, in this think tank. We were building models. Um, to do, I guess someone asked the question, yes, a kind of metric kind of analysis, which is sort of data science and statistics and that kind of stuff. Um, I thought programming was super fun. Did a little in high school and kind of went back to it. Um, led a programming team. But, you know, and, and the bad thing about uh, not to knock uh, government, because I think there's a lot of great people in government, but the agency I was in was just wasn't able to use some of the new, actually very locked down secret stuff, and they couldn't do some of the new um, 
trends. So I went to a company that did some of the new trends, but it was often way back before some of the modern approaches, and it was sit in your cubicle and write code and don't talk to anybody. And that, if you guys know me, is not me. So quickly left that one and became more of a consultant for a company called Platinum Technology, if anyone remembers that. And that was more my sweet spot of working with people, working with data, helping companies understand how to use their data. Um, spent some time in the U.S., also spent time overseas. Um, I worked in Italy for many years, kind of running their data warehousing best practices. A horrible, horrible place to have to live. I'm sarcastic. It was awesome. Um, highly recommend it. Uh, came back to the U.S., um, and they asked me to join product management, so I kind of did product design for one of the metadata repositories on the market back then. Um, also did product management for some of the data modeling tools. And I think, again, that, that programming background that I had done, having been in the field, again, who knows what's going to, you know, help you there. The fact that I had done data architecture, um, I'd also done some product marketing for one of the data architecture tools out there, which really when you talk to somebody thinking about how do you sell a project, well, I literally was selling stuff, right? Um, Found out that I really like the consulting because I like to get my hands dirty doing the stuff, and I like to actually build things to help customers. Not that product management isn't building stuff, um, but for now, I think that's really sort of fun. So I did some time at more of a business consulting company that was more kind of C-level business people doing pure business transformation and less of the data, um, which I think was just eye-opening when you think of how to talk to executives and how executives think and how you really want to transform a business outside of data altogether. Um, but then I realized I like the data stuff. So put the two together to do global data strategy where I think there is a niche in the market where can you take that business transformation experience and link it with data and link it with business and all the other weird and sundry stuff I've done um, and did that. And that's just me. I'm not saying that's the perfect or great or it's just a career. What's next? Who knows, right? <laughs> right? There's so many opportunity. Is it building a new product with some of these new tools that are out there now? I still think there's going to be some great new tool. All right? so I think – you're, uh, there are so many opportunities now. Just keep your eyes open. I wouldn't have planned any of that when I was 16, but you kind of just get there. And I think Ursula um, at EDW has an even better story than mine. Uh, is probably a better speaker than me. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, so if you weren't there to see it, I would recommend that. And, and listen to other people's weird and sundry going off course. So sometimes it might be a role that might not have, like some of my roles had nothing to do with data for a while, um, but it was interesting when I came back to data that those were valuable. So um, in summary, uh, hopefully I had a couple tidbits that might help people. Uh, it's a great time to be in data management. For us old folks, it's finally our day in the sun. That's our little guy. I told you so. I knew you needed to manage your data better. Um, so capitalize on that. Keep learning. Use your strengths um, of knowing how to do the data because I think people need to log communicate it. Um, and most importantly, discover how you can add value to the organization. So that's probably the best tip. What's hot? What do people care about? How can you tie yourself into that? Um, just a few more things before we wrap up. Um, there's me. If anyone has questions or wants to harass me later, <laughs> ask a question or praise or whatever, there I am. Um, there's my company. We do this for a living, so if you need help, let me know. Um, speaking of, of skills, there is a data diversity training center. I particularly have a course on metadata. There's ones on governance and stewardship and a bunch of other stuff as well. Um, there's a whole other series um, throughout the year. So if any of those things we kind of hit on, as I mentioned, MDM, integration, et cetera, let us know. And then without further ado, um, if there's any time for questions, I'll, we'll open that up now. Thanks, Anna. As always, we always have um, another great presentation, and we have a few questions coming in here. We've got a couple of minutes left. Just a reminder um, to answer some of the most popular questions is we will be sending out a link to the slides of the recording in a follow-up email by end of day Monday. I'll also get you the links to um, so you can purchase the links or purchase the recordings from EDW and take a look at um, Ursula's talk. The um, first question coming in here is how do you find the days uh, um, the data advisor roles? I think that's a great question. Um, and, and you don't, you sort of find them in a way, or they're not out there. I have not seen that as a title. You have to almost become that. So I think how you find that is you, you, you make some relationships with the business. You find some problems that need to be solved, and you put those selves in your situation. I would say being approachable and, and showing um, some solutions to problems, um, and then you sort of become – I wouldn't say that's a title. I would say it's almost a – I guess it's a role. You use that correctly. Um, uh, but I think it's becoming approachable, finding the projects that need help, offering yourself up as a helper, and showing your expertise. And I think people will start coming back to you. It's probably my best advice there. Great question. 
And I think that most of the comments were just comments, not a lot of questions coming in today. Everyone's quiet. <laughs> 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 well, I shouldn't say everyone's quiet. This is not a lot of questions. I think it's good. Donna, thank you so much for another fantastic webinar. We so appreciate everything um, and uh, that you do with us, and we look forward to even more and hope to see you all, and thanks to our attendees for being so engaged in everything that we do. We hope to see you all next uh, month in May, as Donna mentioned. Hope everyone has a great day. Thank you. Thank you.